Dr. Kevin Labar uh, uh, with us today. And I've um, been kind of thinking about how to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Labar. He's really a pioneer. Um, and in pioneer to trying to address a, a, what seems to be a very simple but uh, very difficult to answer question, which is how does the brain generate uh, the ways we feel? Um, and uh, I think that what's uh, important here is uh, uh, Dr. Labar was trained in New York and at Yale, um, but in a, in a field that was at that time still evolving, which is affective neuroscience, which is basically trying to understand the brain basis of emotion. Um, he trained with some of the best people in the field. Um, he then moved and really started affective neuroscience at Duke uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, he told us last night he literally kind of came up with the architectural plans of how the, how the department should look. And he's been uh, uh, there, and he's currently uh, 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 you know, heading uh, the program of cognitive, uh, cognition and cognitive neuroscience um, a, 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 at Duke. He uh, has published tremendously. He has really been um, uh, at the forefront of thinking about new ways of probing the brain to better understand uh, you know, how the brain generates feelings. Uh, we talked about this just this morning that we still have a very incomplete understanding of uh, the landscape of emotions. We all experience different kinds of emotions and we know that for many psychiatric disorders, emotions are a key component and yet we're still uh, uh, not clear uh, how these emotions are being generated in the brain. And, and I think what we're gonna hear today is various approaches of how we can potentially do this. And the reason why this is important is if you think that uh, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, are uh, disorders of emotion, then the degree of dysfunction uh, needs to be uh, related back to the organ that produces the dysfunction. And in order to do this, we need to have good paradigms, we need to have good ways of measuring this. Um, and I think you'll see uh, the, the in the, the, the difficulty, but also the, the interesting insights that you get from studying emotion on a, a, a neuronal and neuroscience level. So um, again, I want to welcome very warmly uh, Dr. Kevin Labar. Can you all hear me? Is this mic on? Yes? Okay, good. Well, thanks, Martin, for inviting me and for, for the introduction. Um, what I'm going to be presenting today is sort of a newer approach that my lab has been developing over the past five years to answer this very important question about how emotions are represented in the brain. Um, all the work really was done by my graduate student, uh, Phil Craigel, who's now with Tor Weger in, in Colorado. Um, and some of this work was done in collaboration uh, with uh, Ahmad Hariri and his group on the Duke Neurogenetics Study, as, as you'll see. Um, and so uh, the problem of emotion is that, you know, one of the problems is that it's so complicated um, and that emotions are really typically considered to be some amalgam of behavior and physiology and feeling states. And although we relate so much to the feeling states, they're the hardest things to actually study uh, from a neuroscience perspective. Um, and similarly, if you think about emotion uh, as sort of a series of information processing steps um, where feeling is part of the step, um, a lot of the work is not actually focused on this. It's focused more on the evaluation. How do we evaluate stimuli coming into the environment in terms of what they mean for us emotionally? And a little bit about how we express emotions. But uh, the neuroscience of feeling has, has really kind of uh, fallen to the wayside um, at the detriment, I think, to the field. Um, and so uh, one way in which neuroscientists can gain traction on this is to listen to some psychological theories and to guide our investigations about what uh, psychologists say about how emotions are organized, because that will help us uh, determine what we need to manipulate and, and measure. Um, and so there are two theories I'm going to focus on today. Uh, one that argues that um, this so-called categorical or basic emotions theory that argues that each emotion kind of evolved to serve a different function, and the emotions are pretty much independent in the brain uh, from one another. Um, and what this uh, view would suggest is that you really need to uh, measure uh, each of these separately and that you should come up with separate representations for each of these um, emotions. Whereas the um, dimensional views argue that emotions arise out of some combination of features like arousal and valence um, and that uh, they're organized uh, in a way where they may cluster together, certain emotions would cluster together in this space. So, 
For example, emotions that are high in arousal and negative in valence would be things like anger and disgust, and those things should cluster together uh, and uh, based on the manipulation of arousal and valence. But according to this view, the brain might be coding arousal and valence as the key constructs, um, and so you would want to uh, measure uh, these things dimensionally, and then the emotions arise out of that. Of course, uh, the movie Inside Out has a particular view, which is uh, based on the basic emotions view, that there's sort of one controller in the brain for each emotion. We'll see that's a little bit overly simplistic, um, but nonetheless, it expresses, I think, a good way of thinking about one of these uh, psychological theories and how um, you can think about it. Um, so early evidence from neuroscience um, in the 90s, as Martin was saying, as this field was just kind of really coalescing, um, had made the suggestion a lot on, on patient lesion work that maybe there's a one-to-one -one mapping between specific regions of the brain and specific emotions. And a lot of this came out of data from patients with very selective damage, showing some selective um, problems in either evaluating emotions from, say, facial expressions or in, in the experience of specific emotions. Um, and this kind of had led to this kind of one-to-one -one mapping idea. It turns out that this hasn't necessarily replicated in other patients um, uh, and if you kind of change task parameters even within the same patient, you can get different results. Um, and so um, this kind of, uh, this idea has then uh, morphed into an uh, idea where there may be more uh, distributed systems uh, for emotion. However, the imaging results that sort of initially came in could not really find some systematic patterns uh, for the different emotions. And you ended up getting in these meta-analyses what we call the popcorn effect. It's like you take a, a bag of popcorn that's multicolored, and you just pop it, and you get these you know, popcorn kernels that just emerge in different parts of the brain, and it's not very compelling in terms of a systems-based approach on what these emotion systems might look like. Um, so it looked kind of random, really. Um, and that had led some researchers to basically argue, well, maybe there are no systems of emotion in the brain, that everything is basically constructed, um, perhaps upon um, considerations of things like arousal and valence, according to those dimensional theories. Um, but I am less willing to sort of uh, throw this uh, idea out that there are no systems uh, for uh, specific emotions in the brain. And I think part of this is uh, because some of these meta-analyses were somewhat problematic, which is where some of the critiques are coming from. So a lot of the studies, for example, uh, didn't measure many emotions simultaneously, so they couldn't really discriminate the brain systems within the study that compared the multiple emotions together. Um, all of these studies had relied on these univariate statistical methods, and, and what this does is it basically takes a summary statistic, let's say you show people, I don't know, a fearful face versus a neutral face, and you just summarize the data uh, with a mean summary statistic averaged over a big uh, region of interest, and you basically are reporting where that peak activity is. And so in a way, it's kind of like for voting patterns. If you take all the voters in a state and you characterize them as uh, red or blue states based on this summary statistic of the population average. Um, but more recently, imaging researchers are moving to looking at um, finer grain patterns, uh, multivariate patterns in the data. So for example, uh, in voting patterns, you might look by county. And what you see when you do this is you see patterns that are not um, um, present when you just summarize it in one single big um, summary statistic of that state. So for example, you see different voting patterns depending on if it's a rural or an urban area. And it turns out that that pattern will replicate across the states, uh, and so you're gaining more insight uh, by looking at this finer grain analysis, by looking at um, more specific patterns, okay? Um, another issue um, is that um, uh, a lot of the stimuli that were used in these studies um, didn't actually elicit strong emotional responses. So use things like faces that might evoke a little bit of a reaction, but not much. And so to get at the issue of feeling states, a lot of these studies weren't really using the kinds of stimuli that were appropriate to answer the question. Um, another issue is just confirmation bias. And some of these, uh, they were testing their specific pet theory, but then not considering whether other theories might also account for uh, the data. Um, so how can we kind of move forward from this impasse uh, in the field? Um, and so what I'm gonna describe here is a more discovery-based science of what I'm calling emotion information mapping, um, which uh, is different from emotion activation mapping in that we're not just interested in a summary statistic of where the most significant activity is for an emotion induction, but what are the distributed patterns of activity um, and, and uh, how does a, a, a pattern classifier 
kind of use the different information from the different voxels in the brain to discriminate emotions from one another. They may not be the most activated voxel, right? So you're, you're getting uh, kind of a bigger picture view. So the way that we do this, um, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, pattern classification, is we basically take uh, a training sample of subjects where we induce specific emotions. So I might take this half of the room, uh, induce emotions in you, um, and then I train this pattern classifier to distinguish either the brain correlates through fMRI or autonomic measures through psychophysiology that uh, maximally discriminate the emotions from one another. So we're trying to separate out what, what are the informative signals, either in the autonomic signals or in the brain, that can separate out the emotions from one another. This generates candidate, what I call information maps. These are the, either the regions of the brain or the autonomic signatures that are informative to the pattern classifier. Uh, and then uh, we go back and I might test the, that algorithm on a new set of subjects. So say the left half of this room to see whether it can classify the emotions in those subjects based on the weightings of the patterns in an independent sample, right? So we're, we're generating basically predictive models to see how well it can predict the emotions in a new sample based on the patterns we see, uh, the weightings that we see in an independent sample, okay? And then this gives us um, some cross-validated um, emotion maps with performance metrics. How well does it do uh, in making those predictions? And then we can link that back to theory. So even though we're starting with a data-driven method, um, we can then link things back to theory, uh, for example, by um, trying to understand what the pattern classifier is using and whether it's using um, uh, features uh, that are predicted uh, based on, say, a dimensional model or a categorical model. And one way I'm going to show you about how you do this is to look at the error analysis. So when a pattern classifier misclassifies, does it misclassify the emotions in a way that would be predicted by the dimensional models or the categorical models. So I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then finally, we can do some more external validation. So, um, uh, so you might have a certain induction that you used. Does this generalize to other kinds of inductions, other kinds of emotional inductions? And also, does it track individual differences? So people that um, are more anxious, uh, are they going to activate uh, more this sort of fear network than, say, some of these other networks? Um, so this is uh, the approach that I'm going to be I'm advocating for today. Um, this is just sort of a summary of what I've said, so I don't think I need to go through that. Um, so what I'm going to present is um, an induction method for which we first collected psychophysiology data, and then we did the same induction in the fMRI uh, facility, uh, and then I'm going to show you how we can apply the outcomes of this to looking at spontaneous emotions when people are just resting in the scanner. Um, so the emotion induction procedure we use is, uh, was developed uh, was adapted from um, a previous study in which we take film clips and instrumental music uh, that have been normed and validated to elicit these specific seven categories uh, of emotion, including a neutral state. Um, what's important about this is that these span, uh, these uh, span both kind of basic emotions theories as well as they span the space of arousal and valence uh, so that we can test also the dimensional theories as well. Um, and we have two exemplars per each induction method. And then um, online, what we ask is people to self-report each of the clips um, on 23 items, some of which are emotion categories, some of which are emotion dimensions. Uh, and then um, we have a washout period, and then we present the next stimulus, okay? Um, if you're interested in what the stimuli are, here's some of them. So amusement is a clip from when Harry met Sally. Um, you know, sadness is Chopin's funeral march, things like this. Um, and we do collect familiarity ratings and use that as a regressor of no interest, and it doesn't seem to really matter whether they're familiar with the material or not. Um, anyway, so, um, so just looking at the self-report data, um, what I'm showing you, these are all the ratings that people provided. This is an average. Um, normalized score across the whole sample. Uh, and then this is what uh, the pattern classifier is sort of um, uh, predicting what the outcome is. And what you can see is basically that um, we get good correspondence between essentially the intended emotion and the high ratings for that emotion in our specific sample. Um, so uh, these, uh, these uh, red uh, ratings here are a higher correlation between 
uh, what the subject reported and what the intended emotion was. So this is just validating that people are self-reporting the same emotion that the norm sample provided, and also that they rate things that are uh, positive uh, in affect with positive ratings and negative affect with negative ratings. So this is just validating um, that this uh, induction works. But now what we want to do is try to predict what emotion uh, the uh, subject um, is, uh, the kind of clip it is, based solely on reading autonomic data from the participants, all right? So here what we do is we're recording four sources, electrodermal activity, cardiac, respiratory, and gastric activity. Um, from those four sources, we derive 16 dependent measures or, um, that um, are various components of these um, sources. Uh, and then we feed this into a pattern classifier. Um, and so these are essentially the features that are being used by the classifier uh, for each subject. And uh, again, we do this, uh, uh, this uh, series uh, sequence in which we train it on half of the room, half of the subjects. Um, and it will go through an optimization feature where we'll try to determine which of these measures best separates out fear from other emotions, sadness from other emotions, anger from other emotions. Um, <clears throat> this is a nonlinear classifier. We've also done it with linear for those of you who are interested in that detail. Nonlinear performs better. Um, but in any way, what we then do is once we optimize this, um, we then test that classifier performance on a new sample. Um, so the classifier will spit out on this trial, you know, the subject was probably seeing the fearful clip, on this trial it's probably seeing the anger clip, um, and then we can compare that to the stimuli that they were actually saw so we can classify the performance in the classifier, okay? Um, so we did this both for the self-report data and for the physio data, two separate models. Um, we're always using the normed ratings as our gold standard because you want the, the normed um, uh, classification. Uh, you want it to be independent of the data that you're actually modeling. Um, so, um, and then uh, the other thing to note is that because we have seven emotions, a chance uh, rating is one out of seven, which is 14.3%. Um, so if the, the pattern classifier was just performing at chance, we would expect it to be down here. Um, but instead, it's classifying about 88% of self-report data correctly. Um, and from the uh, physiological data, it's doing about 58% of the time uh, it's uh, performing correctly. And these are both very significantly different from what you would expect by chance. So these are pretty big effect sizes, actually, uh, compared to chance level performance. There's no difference between music and film. It can do that equally as well. So it's not biased towards one uh, induction versus the other. Now, what you don't know is what the pattern classifier is using to do its judgment, all right? So that's not apparent from just looking at accuracy rates. Um, and so one way, again, to do this is to look at when the pattern classifier makes an error, um, does it make an error that would be predicted by one emotion theory or another? So according to this dimensional theory, um, the idea is that uh, because emotions, these specific emotions are constructed out of arousal and valence, you should more easily confuse emotions that share high arousal or high valence or low arousal, low valence. So here, for example, contentment, which is in red, and amusement, which is in yellow, these are very close to each other in this space. And so you would expect that a pattern classifier, if it makes an error on a contentment trial, it might misclassify it as amusement. And it would be less likely to misclassify it as fear or anger, which is going to show up over here. So what you can do is you calculate the uh, kind of the Euclidean distance of each pairwise emotion um, and see whether the pattern of errors um, is related to the distance in this space. That's what you would predict based on the dimensional model. A categorical model just says that each emotion is independent. So basically you create a model, which is a seven-dimensional model, which is hard to um, visualize. <laughs> but basically each emotion would be its own independent axis, orthogonal axis. And then you can calculate the, uh, the distance metrics in that space as well. So you can create a, a distance metric for this model, distance metric for the categorical model, and again, the categorical model would predict that there's actually, it would be no more likely to mistake contentment for amusement as it would to, con to relate contentment to fear. And so that's what the categorical model would predict, that there's really no relationship uh, between those. So again, we did this for the physiology and the self-report, and uh, what we're showing for the categorical model prediction is that for both physiology and self-report, 
uh, the number of classification errors uh, increases as the distance decreases. So it's a negative relationship. So as things get closer in this space, um, you end up having more errors. Right? So that's the according to the categorical model. But the predictions of the dimensional model only hold up for self-report, but not for peripheral physiology. So when it was classifying things based solely on autonomic data, it was not more likely to mistake, um, to confuse contentment with amusement than it would be to uh, confuse contentment with fear, for example. So that is not predicted by the dimensional model. Um, so that's this uh, flat line here. So there's a couple interesting things just about this. Number one is that at the level of the autonomic representation and at the level of self-report, um, there may be variance that's explained by different theoretical constructs, um, where the autonomic data seems to be more categorical in terms of what the pattern classifier is using to distinguish emotions. But then at the level of self-report, that categorical um, uh, information is being combined with dimensional information in some way um, to, um, to differentiate emotions. So at the different levels of emotion representation, there might be different features that are contributing. Um, and also just that the categorical model is more consistent. That was the same point, but that it's more consistent across these two uh, data sets. Okay. Um, so next we wanted to take this into the brain and basically do the same thing. So we did this in the scanner. Um, when you move to brain data, it's, it becomes exponentially more, more data. <laughs> it's very complicated. And so in order to uh, do this, um, you have to do a dimensionality reduction. Uh, there's so many features. So basically what we're doing here is we're taking uh, essentially uh, fMRI responses to each trial in, in a GLM, single trial beta estimates. Uh, and uh, we mask just the gray voxels, just to simplify this. So this ends up being about 20,000 features uh, per subject. Um, and then uh, we try to do the same thing. We try to train it on a portion of the subjects uh, in the study, and it tries to then derive which of the brain regions are maximally discriminative of fear versus other emotions, sadness versus other emotions, et cetera, um, based on the patterns of brain activity. Um, we do a dimensionality reduction uh, procedure to do this, so we identify a smaller number of latent variables that characterize this massive data set. Um, and then what ends up happening is we end up with these brain maps for each emotion where uh, the pattern classifier is saying, hey, I'm gonna weight these brain regions for this emotion that seems to do the best job. I'm gonna weight these other brain regions for this emotion. And then, again, we test those predictions by testing the classifier on a new set of data from a new set of participants and testing how well it does. Um, so here, uh, again, uh, you, can, you can see essentially the, uh, what's called the confusion matrix with a good correspondence along the diagonal. Here, the mean accuracy goes down to about 37%, but again, chance is still 14.3%. So this is uh, significantly um, greater than chance. Again, we see no difference between music and film. Um, and we can even train it on one modality and it, to then predict the other modality. So we can train it on music and then predict film and vice versa. Uh, it doesn't do as well with that because you have half the amount of data. Um, so, um, so basically, um, we are getting um, a reasonable differentiation of these emotion states in the brain. And this is what these look like. So this is basically um, the, uh, the voxels that provided unique information that the pattern classifier is using for each emotional state. So contentment, amusement, surprise, fear, anger, sadness, and neutral. So you can see that this looks very different from the popcorn brain meta-analysis approach and this actually looks like sort of reasonable networks. They span subcortical, limbic, uh, thalamic, cortical networks. And some of them correspond with some things that we know from the univariate literature. So for example, a lot of surprise in the cingulate cortex, fear in the amygdala. Um, so, um, so, you know, just from a face validity perspective, this looks kind of like what you might expect um, uh, in terms of what we know about how distributed systems work in the brain. Another interesting point about these is that um, the overlap is pretty minimal. So there's only about 3% of voxels that overlap um, these pairwise comparisons. Um, and so this is, you know, what, you know, this, it doesn't necessarily have to be this way, but it, it basically suggests that these are actually pretty segregated in the brain. Um, and um, what else did I want to say about that? 
Um, and this is just showing you kind of where some of that overlap is. So one thing that you can see is sort of some regions have more importance. So like the cingulate is really important for a variety of emotions, right? So at a, at a macro level, there are some emotions where uh, there are some brain regions that are uh, involved. But when you actually look at the actual patterns, they're sort of more interdigitated. Um, so there's, there's not you know, very much overlap. So for example, this contentment is, is more posterior than the surprise, et cetera. Um, so uh, the next thing we then wanted to do was to relate this to the self-report data itself in the subjects. Um, and so what we did here was we're plotting out uh, every time the pattern classifier spit out um, uh, an emotional prediction. So in red, let's just look at the red line. This is the contentment trials. Um, we wanted to relate that to the um, amount of emotion that's expressed in individual subjects. And this is a um, standardized score, which is centered at zero. Zero doesn't mean there's no emotion. That's zero is kind of where the mean is uh, for the group. Um, and so what I'm plotting here is basically the hits uh, and the false alarms. Um, so uh, again, importantly, we ask subjects to uh, rate every single item on every single emotion label. So we can look at um, the uh, so-called minor emotions. Let's say the clip was intended to induce sadness, but it might induce a little bit of fear or a little bit of, um, you know, anger. Uh, we can actually uh, look at that. Like so, um, so these points out here on the very edge, um, it, where the where the hits basically when uh, the it was intended to be a contentment trial and the pattern classifier predicted it as a contentment trial. But here are the false alarms. So this is basically when the pattern classifier misclassified it as contentment, even though it wasn't supposed to be. And when you, we're trying to sh what we show here is that even on those trials, subjects report you know, a little bit of the emotion here. And when it, cla when it makes uh, class fewer classifications, basically the amount of experienced emotion uh, goes down. So there's a nice correlation or tracking of the classification performance with the self-report data um, for each of these emotions. All right, and then you can use this to calculate kind of the sensitivity to detect these emotions, and the sensitivity on average is about 0.74, which is pretty good. Um, and again, you have to think about this, that this is a seven-fold classification problem. It's a very, very hard problem. So in a clinical term, it's, it's, if you think of it as trying to distinguish anxiety from depression, from schizophrenia, from bipolar, from whatever, and trying to find you know, brain patterns that discriminate each of those, um, and so, um, um, so I think that this is it's pretty miraculous, actually, that it, that it does this well based on you know, what we're asking it to do. Um, and then again, we can do the error analysis uh, to look at, um, from a theoretical perspective, whether it's using categorical or dimensional information to, um, uh, to make its classification. And here, uh, we combined these uh, terms into a single model. Um, and uh, what, we, what we see here, and actually a model that included both terms um, was the best model from a Bayesian model perspective. What was interesting is about the sign of those terms. So basically, uh, the categorical, categorical information had this negative relationship uh, with error performance, which is exactly what we showed in the autonomic data, right? Um, and, however, the dimensional term was positive. So it said when things were more different, in, were, uh, yeah, more different in categorical space, uh, it actually uh, made more errors, which is not what the theory would predict. The theory would predict it would be easier to classify things that were far apart in this arousal and valence space. Um, and remember, again, with the physiological data, we showed that this ha had no relationship, basically. It was flat. Um, and so one way uh, to think about that, well, first of all, is just it doesn't follow, it doesn't conform with the predictions of the theory. Um, but secondly, one way to, to, that we've been thinking about this is that maybe um, when things differ in arousal, um, it is somehow confusing the pattern classifier because these category representations are embedded within that arousal coding. And so one way to look at that is just, I'll give you an example here. So we just used arousal as a parametric modulator in red. So you can see a lot of like temporal lobe activity, for example. Um, but when you look at the representation of these emotions, they're actually interdigitated within this global area. So if you, if the pat, so in other words, arousal could not really be that useful to the pattern classifier because it, it covers all this area and these emotions are sort of embedded within there. So it might be masking um, 
the representations by, um, and so it basically is not that informative, okay? Okay, so, um, so this is all well and good, but what a lot of people said, well, can we actually use these maps to predict emotions that were not used to train it? Uh, or not emotions were used to train it, but stimuli that were used to train it. All right, so how well do these generalize? So we thought that the hardest test case for this would be spontaneous emotion, all right? So what if you don't present any stimuli uh, at all? Um, and people are just at rest in the scanner, and when you're in a scanner, if you've been in a scanner, you know, you kind of cycle through various thoughts and various feeling states as you go through there. And so what should happen if this, if our approach is correct, is that these patterns for fear and sadness and amusement should kind of come and go uh, during a resting state scan. The brain should kind of uh, go into these modes of emotions in and out and cycle through them uh, during the scan. It will cycle through many other things that we haven't measured here, of course. It's not just cycling through these seven states. Um, but we should be able to see the emergence of these things at rest, okay? Um, and then we can relate this to individual differences in mood and personality uh, that kind of relate to uh, these specific emotions. So the way that we did this, and this is what we did in conjunction with Ahmad Hariri, we had a fairly large sample of subjects who had two resting state scans back to back, about eight and a half minutes total, four, four and some plus minutes each. Um, and <clears throat> what we did was we took for each sample of data during the resting state period, we just looked to see the extent to which that brain state at that point matched one of these seven templates, okay? Um, and so we just did a cross product basically between the intensity values at each time point during the resting state scan and each of these seven maps. And the idea is at each point in time, does the brain look like it's more in this state or this state or this state or this state? And then we just take the maximum at each time point and we assign that to that category, right? Again, the brain could be in lots of other states that we don't sample. So we're looking at just the relative evidence that it might match one of these states over time. Um, <clears throat> now, if this is um, just, if these patterns here are nonsensical, they're just random, you would expect that the distribution, the frequency distribution would be flat, right? It wouldn't be more likely to, that one of these would emerge over another one. So we tested that, and that actually was not the case. So um, again, this is sort of just the, um, the chance level. Um, uh, this would be would predict the uniform distribution. And what you see is some states were more frequently uh, came out in the classification than others. So neutral was the highest, and contentment was the lowest, for example. Um, and then the other thing that we asked is uh, whether there might be some consistent cycling of these emotions just based on time. So a lot of people, when they get in the scanner for the first time, they get anxious, right? So you would make the prediction that maybe fear uh, would be classified more often in the very beginning of the scan when people first get in there, and then maybe it would subside over time. Um, and that's exactly what we found. So fear is this teal sort of color, and at the very beginning, the first 20 or 30 seconds, uh, fear was the one that was most likely to be uh, classified, and amusement the least. <laughs> least likely to be classified. You're not amused when they first get in there. Um, but you can see that there's sort of convergence of these over time, right? Um, and then at the beginning of the second run, they don't go out of the scanner, they just, there's a break and then they start again. The fear one comes up a little bit, but then it's mixed in with some other emotions, right? Um, and in general, if you look over time, the negative emotions tend to go down over time. So this is sad, uh, sad, so it goes down over time whereas the more neutral or positive emotions tend to go up over time. If you just look at linear trends over time, you get this kind of general shift in emotions. So I think this has a lot of implications for those of us who do emotion research, is that there are going to be uh, varying states that are cycling through the resting state period, and you probably want to avoid doing emotion induction in the first 30 seconds or so, because these don't stabilize you know, for some period of time. And that, you know, so in other words, if you're trying to say you're trying to do a, a fear induction, but the brain is already in this high state, you're probably not going to see much of a modulation of that over and above what the state it's already in. Um, and so, so that's just a practical 
uh, kind of application of this in terms of people that do uh, imaging of emotion. All right, so now what we wanted to do is try to track this with individual differences in anxiety and depression and see if they tracked the frequency with which these kind of sad and fearful states emerge during rest. And so uh, when people got out of the scanner, um, we got state inventories on depression and anxiety, and we asked them to report this based on their experience in the scanner itself, so uh, how they felt while they were in there. Um, and what you can see is that uh, the, the extent to which people endorse feeling depressed actually scaled with the frequency of occurrence of this sad state during the resting state scan and not any of the other states. Um, and for anxiety, um, it correlated with the, fe the fear classifications um, and in a negative way with the contentment classification. So we're seeing some specificity, which I think gives us some additional convergent validity for these maps other than just the inductions that we did to create them in the other, in the other study. And then <clears throat> we also looked at some trait measures of uh, anxiety, angry, hostility, and depression, and saw very similar effects. Um, basically, a selective increase um, in uh, fear classifications for trait anxiety, um, for trait angry hostility uh, in the anger map, and for trait depression, it was here both fear and, and sadness. Okay, but, um, and I, I didn't show the other ones because they're not significant, um, but um, so we're seeing, I think, some. This provides some additional validation of these maps as indexing processes that might be sensitive to individual differences. And again, this is just individuals lying in the scanner at rest, and we're able to pull these um, relationships out. <clears throat> so the next thing that we did um, was to actually see if we could predict um, the emotions that people were feeling um, intermittently in the scanner. So we just put a new group of subjects in, um, did a 40 minute resting state period, and every 30 seconds we just had them rate, uh, well, this was using the Geneva motion wheel, um, which of these seven emotions, uh, if any of them, uh, were you feeling at this moment, okay? And if they weren't feeling any, they just didn't move the joystick to any of them. Um, and so they reported their rating, their conscious uh, rating feelings uh, every 30 seconds or so in there. And then what we did was uh, we went back in time uh, about 10 seconds or about five scans. We actually extended this back to 20 seconds and got very similar results. So about 10 to 20 seconds back. Um, and we fed these scans into the pattern classifier. And we said, okay, which brain state does this person look like they're in? Um, and then we accumulated uh, those frequency counts with the frequency counts of the self-report of the subject. So what we see is a nice correlation between the frequency counts of the emotions that they reported and the frequency of the classification by the pattern classifier. Now this is averaged across subjects uh, because not every subject cycles through every one of these emotions in the scan. So this is not like on an individual person trial by trial correlation, but it's averaged across subjects. On average, um, you know, we're seeing this nice relationship. You also see some interesting things here from the emotion perspective. People don't like to self-report negative uh, emotions. They're kind of clustered down here. <laughs> Um, they tend to report, you know, neutral and, you know, more positive emotions. Um, but uh, when, you know, when they do report those emotions, uh, the pattern classifier is saying that, that this looks like it's the state that they're actually in. So, um, so at least these, this is a healthy sample. Uh, mostly healthy. This is a healthy sample. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... Um, the next question that we asked, again, to, for further uh, kind of validation of this is, how reliable is this over time? So if people go in um, day after day after day, you know, do these patterns of, you know, motion fluctuations at rest look similar over days or, or, or do they change? So in other words, how reliable is this um, as a measure? So we had access to this unique data set uh, by Russ Poldrack, his My Connectome project, uh, where he scanned himself. Um, 70 times over a, a year period. And um, I can say his name, it's not a PHI violation because it's known that this is his data. Um, but anyway, he scanned himself uh, over this period. And so what we wanted to do was to basically do a split half reliability analysis to see how consistent these patterns were on even days versus odd days of scanning. 
Um, and what we see is a very nice correspondence in him in the odd number and even numbered sessions where the classifier is classifying these specific emotions. So there's no significant difference in any of these. And so it seems like, uh, at least for an N of one, <laughs> these are pretty stable um, indicators. Um, and we're sort of calling this a polyaffective state profile of an individual. Like, to what extent are they um, experiencing these different emotions while they're just at rest uh, for a period of time? Um, now, the other thing that's interesting uh, is that to think about using this as an individual difference measure to compare his patterns uh, versus the group average that we had done before. And so this might allow us to start looking at individual differences in spontaneous affect from resting state data. And so, uh, so these are his even odd scans in blue and red that I just showed you compared to our group average from the previous controls. Um, and so you can start seeing some differences here. Um, so he comes across as being a little more angry than <laughs> at his resting state scan than uh, others, but also somewhat, you know, uh, where is he? Yeah, more content. So this is a little confusing, right? Because it seemed like, why, how could he be sort of, uh, you know, have these kind of patterns that look perhaps a little bit contradictory? And so it turns out that if you look over time, there are large scale trends um, in the drift of his uh, affective state over a year, uh, where his contentment scores went up over time and his angry scores went down. And at the end of this, he got a job at Stanford. So he was actually uh, moving in the process during this time of going from the University of Texas at Austin to Stanford and got his dream job. Um, so that's just a complete anecdote, of course. <laughs> but it's interesting that this is the pattern that emerges and these are the life experiences that he was having at that time. But anyway, what I just want to show here is that this can perhaps be used um, to look at individual differences um, and also to even look at large scale changes in fluctuations, perhaps seasonal changes if you want to look at seasonal affective disorder or things like this, it may be a useful tool. Okay, um, so I just have one last point, um, which is we are now starting to think about trying to quantify how these states, how you transition from one state to another state. Um, so everything that we've done so far is just accumulating frequency counts over time but it doesn't tell you how people are transitioning from one state to another. So for example, in Russ's data, where he's more angry, is it that he gets into an angry state and he just stays there, so it's a persistent state, or is it that he keeps going back to anger intermittently over the course of the resting state scan? So wh what is the pattern of the dynamics of these states and, and how they relate to each other? Um, so we're starting to do some kind of Markov uh, process modeling of these um, uh, over time. And basically what we can get with this is, um, uh, and looking at the transition probabilities, what is the likelihood that if you're in a state of sadness, you're gonna transition to a state of fear? Or if you start in a state of fear, what is the likelihood that you're gonna go to a neutral state, all right? And so for each individual subject, we can classify their states over time. Um, and uh, again, with the color indicating the, um, the state that had uh, the most evidence for it at that specific point in the resting state scan. And then we can do a transition uh, conditional probability matrix uh, where we just say, how often do you go from state I to state J? All right. And uh, then we can create a kind of a null model to see, uh, are there more, some transitions that are more likely than what you would get by chance? Um, and the finding that we got that is interesting about this is that people are more likely, no matter what state they start in, um, they're more likely to go to a neutral state as the next state. Um, and then they will go to another emotional state, all right? And so when you graph this out, essentially it looks like neutral states are kind of a hub um, for this affective space where people might start in amusement state, then they go to neutral, then they go to another one, then they come back to neutral, and then they go out. Um, so neutral seems to be sort of like this reset point we might, we, we'd like to think about this as maybe a regulation, emotion regulation aspect of this. So where you're more likely to kind of reset and then go into another aspect of state in between. Um, and so, um, and then we asked um, within our own sample, does this, so if this serves some kind of emotion regulation function, maybe it's not as present in individuals who have a DSM diagnosis, all right? So 
there's actually a small percentage in the DSM study, about 14% of a mod sample, who have a, a diagnosis of um, anxiety, depression, addiction, et cetera. Um, and for this, we just lumped them all together, uh, just because there weren't, there's only 14% in the sample, so we couldn't really look at it at a more fine-grained analysis. But the idea is that maybe those individuals are not going to cycle through that neutral state, and they're just going to go from, you know, anger to fear directly. Um, and that's basically what we found. So uh, in the healthy controls, this is the likelihood that you're going to transition um, to neutral from another state. And that uh, percentage is lower in those individuals that have a DSM diagnosis. Um, and then we replicated this in a different sample, this NKI Rockland sample, and showed basically the same thing. Um, and then what you can do, the other thing that we did was we asked uh, about a measure of inertia. That is, what is it that, these are called self-transitions. Uh, what is the likelihood that you're likely to stay in one state given that you're in that state? So. Um, uh, that you can't move out of a given emotional state. So this is the inertia data, um, again, showing the opposite, that people with um, DSM diagnoses are more likely to stay in whatever affect state they're in for a longer period of time. Well, this is just one transition. Uh, then healthy controls, um, and again, that replicated in this Rockland sample. Um, so it seems like there might be something diagnostic about patterns of fluctuations of spontaneous affect at rest that we might be able to pick up with these decoding models that otherwise we would have no way of being able to do. So just taking resting state data, the top you know, eight or nine networks that you see in resting state data don't align with these networks. Uh, we've actually done the overlap of that. They only overlap about 12 or 13 percent. So you can't just look at resting state data, take out the top couple of networks and, and make some inference about their affective function. Um, but it looks like these uh, are, are perhaps doing a, a better job of that. Um, anyway, so um, just a couple of closing notes. Um, so the typical model in, in at least in affective science research is to start with, you know, basic research in animal models and do a forward translation into clinical studies. Um, but what I think, you know, this kind of provides us, and, and this is kind of the way it's been. So, right, to understand fear, we do fear conditioning or we do fear potentiated startle. Um, we map those circuits out in the rodents. And then we try to translate forward from those circuits into humans. But now, I think, with these tools, we have the possibility of identifying new circuits or new combinations of circuits using machine learning and imaging. Uh, and then we can reverse translate that back. So uh, we can then maybe start recording from these areas in the rodent models, maybe doing some optogenetics to, dis to discern you know, which, ones of the, which of these pathways are really relevant uh, for uh, fear behavior or look at oscillatory patterns to see if these patterns are resonating at certain frequencies that we can then identify um, and then go forward to then, you know, maybe do some TMS to knock out some components of the circuit and see how it affects uh, behavior. And then finally, I think this just um, is a general uh, transition in affective neuroscience as a field where I think in the 90s, uh, the, these kind of very modular patterns of kind of subcortical circuits that are specific to emotions that, that arose out of these animal models kind of were, were dominant. So this idea of kind of modular uh, systems that, um, that corresponded to these, and yet that didn't really seem to hold. In the 2000s, we ended up with this popcorn random model where it didn't look like there were any uh, reasonable uh, networks that were selective for emotions. And now we're moving into maybe this distributed uh, state where there are, emotions are represented at some, you know, distributed level and that there's some nodes that are maybe connecting, or hubs that are connecting these emotions in ways that you can transition among these. And so this is a way uh, that, at least currently, I think this data are kind of moving into that direction. Um, and I should say that the, this whole slide came from a social network, a network analysis that had nothing to do with emotions. All right, so I didn't put reality here to say that this is the correct reality, but this is, this is basically what um, uh, kind of was talking about uh, different um, social networks and how they can be organized. Um, but, but I saw some parallels between this and what we're seeing in affective uh, neuroscience. So, um, I, you know, the gold standard in emotion research is self-report. Self-report is tricky, as some of you know. Um, but hopefully uh, this is moving us to, uh, to go beyond self-report. So Klaus Scherer is saying there are no objective me methods of measuring the subjective experience of a person during an emotion episode. 
There's no access other than to ask them to report. Um, uh, and as you know, there are some conditions in, in children, for example, patients with dementia, alexithymia, where they can't really report on their emotions. Um, and, so, um, and so that's you know, problematic. Um, and then what Russ himself has said in a new book that's coming out about this mind reading stuff, uh, deducing a person's, well, this is actually a review of this, uh, deducing a person's mental or emotional state solely on the basis of brain activity remains an important challenge. It will require more detailed understanding about how complex emotions are processed and represented throughout the brain and how activity gets combined across space and time. So I think these new tools are kind of pushing us into a kind of a new frontier or a new direction to understand emotion representation. Thank you. Questions, Martin. So that seems to say just what you're what you're saying is that with with your pattern classifier, you might be able to use standard regression tricks and just say, well, this person worked with such and such emotion at this point. Mm -hmm. um, given that you worked with this for some time now, how robust and how reliable do you think it is? So that uh, you know that this could be used uh, in almost in a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And what what do you think? Yeah. So I think um, the numbers for the sensitivity and specificity are not quite what you would want for diagnostic tools, right? 74% sensitivity, it's okay, but it's not great. Um, that doesn't mean that they may not have higher sensitivity once you apply them to uh, clinical you know, diagnoses. Maybe actually they perform really well once you do that. But I would want to refine the maps a little bit more. Um, have other inductions, maybe autobiographical memory inductions, other kinds of inductions to kind of just solidify the maps a little bit more. You know, it was based on a sample of, I don't know, 30 subject, 32 subjects, healthy young adults. I think it would be great to scale this up to have a larger number of inductions. Uh, you could even expand it to include other emotions, although I have to say this study, because we did the self-report in the scanner, it took three hours. So it was, it was separated across two days, hour and a half each day. So doing this validation is really tricky, you know, um, which is why I'm excited about the resting state application because they can just be in there for eight minutes and, you know, uh, right. But to do the validation, I would like to, to get a, a wider range of individuals, a more of a community-based sample, um, more inductions, maybe even other emotions if we, if we do the reporting a different way, um, just to try to increase that validation before, you know, we, we go and apply them. That, that, that would be my, you know what I would, that would be my dream of how, how it should go forward. Um, whether a funding agency agrees with that or not, we'll have to see. <laughs> because we use instrumental music and you cannot elicit disgust with instrumental music. That is the answer. So we had vis you know, video clips that could do it, but uh, that is the one emotion you cannot dis that you cannot get with instrumental music, it so turns out. Yeah, so this gets at um, uh, a more fine-grained representation. So I think that these emotions that I, we looked at, these sort of basic emotions, are more prototypical categories of things that might be related. So for example, you know, fear might be related to apprehension, which might be related to dread. You know, so if you get more at that level of these kind of subtle variations of the same family of emotions, there you might start seeing more similarity um, than you know, the distinct basic emotions that we looked at. Because you know, somebody asked me in the, in the past, you know, well, how far can you go with this? Right? Can you discriminate every single emotion from every other one? You know, and part of that is it's, it's going to be tricky because you'd have to induce them reliably in subjects using validated stimuli that uniquely index that emotion and not others. It's really hard, you know. So these prototypical emotions are easier uh, for that purpose. But certainly we can expand. There are now new stimuli that Martin and I talked about, new stimuli that you can use. You know, you don't have to use instrumental music, just use whatever. There are more stimuli that are coming out that assay of uh, more emotions. Uh, with vocal affect and other things so that, you know, we can expand this research program. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I was intrigued by the fact that um, the pattern classifier relationship broke down for the big 
geological data, yep. which is one of the, yep. the dimensional models. That yeah, the dimensions, it, it didn't use the, any dimensions, even though, of course, the autonomic system signals arousal, right? So it's not that it doesn't signal arousal, it's that it wasn't useful to the pattern classifier to distinguish fear from anger. Right? In the dimensional, but not the pedigree. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I think that um, I think the coding the coding at the level of the autonomic nervous system may uh, be careful about how to say it, may not be as nuanced as you might need it to be in order to pull out some of those dimensions of experience so that they are um, they're informative to differentiate emotions from one another. Um, if we did a simpler classification, so if we just did fear versus neutral, happy, sad, then it might be able to pull out. It might be able to just use, let's say, sympathetic arousal marker to distinguish you know, fear versus neutral, right? Because it's an easy classification problem. You could just rely on that arousal signal, and that's going to be useful enough. But when you have to discriminate seven emotions from one another, you know, it, it's just not, the autonomic nervous system doesn't have that nuanced signaling that allows it to kind of use those dimensions and, in a graded way that differentiates all those emotions from one another. Yeah, that's, that's, what I, that's one way to think about it. Um, yeah. Ah, yes. No. <laughs> uh, no, and part of that is because um, yeah, it's, co it's complicated. So you have to do dimensionality reduction for the brain data. I mean, I guess you could. Like, we could have done it for the autonomic data, too, right? We could have done it in reduction. We just didn't need to do it um, because it, you don't have a problem overfitting there because you have a small number of input variables relative to the number of observations. Um, the other thing is that the autonomic data did better uh, with a nonlinear algorithm than a linear algorithm. Um, and what that suggests is that there's actually interactions among those variables that are helping to drive that classification. So it's not just heart rate and respiration. It's heart rate and respiration in the context of one emotion relative to another emotion. It's helping to separate out. And, um, and, and so we actually compared that. So when you do linear with autonomic, it's <clears throat> not as good. So then you're not optimizing the classifier performance for the data that you have. And it makes it a little bit tricky. Yeah. But I would love to relate the brain data to the physio data. Like, uh, you know, is the, um, you know, are, are the voxels that are signaling fear, are those driving, which of those are driving the autonomic measures that it's using? Is there a relationship between there in some, some sense? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yep. Maybe. Yeah. So there's some debate on whether neutral is really an emotion or what it is. It, yeah. So, um, you know, is feeling neutral? So you do say things like, I'm feeling pretty neutral about this political candidate. It's actually a state, but is that the same thing as a default state or a resting state? I'm not sure. It doesn't overlap that much with default state, default network. Some of the components overlap, but it's not quite that. So uh, I still would feel, yeah, I, I don't know. But, but yes, you could. You absolutely could. You could say, where, where is the person in this, what looks like a neutral state, and then let's analyze that. Sure. Yeah, if you want to do some kind of emotion analysis and you don't want it to be confounded by baseline fluctuations and spontaneous affect, that would be a good way of doing that. These are all uh, young adults, um, you know, 18 to 40. 
you know, I would say. We didn't look at this in older adults or kids. Um, and part of it's because the stimuli aren't really validated for kids, for example, and older adults too. Some of the movies are kind of graphic, and so um, I think you would need to, we're interested in expanding this, but then you need, I think, different stimuli um, that you have validation for across the age ranges. Because we can't assume that, yeah, the classification of the kids is gonna match what the adult pattern is, right? Yeah. There's somebody back there. Yep. So, sure. So th this is what uh, this kind of Russ is cautioning against this. Um, so, I mean, we've shown associations between subjective report and the presence of these states, you know. Uh, but that's just a correlation. The correlation was, you know, 0 .9, 0 0.39 or something like that. So it's not like there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the prediction and, and the person's um, uh, feeling state. And there's so many feeling states that we haven't sampled in here. So the person may not have been angry at all, you know, but it's just the, of the emotions we sampled, it looked more like anger than other things. But they may be in a subjective state that is not one that we sampled. And so that's where the, the reverse inference is a little bit tricky, I think, because uh, you're not sampling the entire space of states that they could be in. Um, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, uh, clearly emotion is complex. Yep. And it has very specific beginnings in some of them. So, mm -hmm. how do you actually do the search to apply to anything? You know? Sure. And then, uh, you know, you can tell by states, you can uh, classify them, you know, provide the basic kind of signal of using not necessarily emotion, but something else. You know? mm -hmm. Sure. Well, they have some frontal cortex. Yeah. The, the alignment is not so clear, but, but yeah, I mean, of the regions that you can sample, you know, what I would be interested in is inducing fear in a rat using a predator exposure paradigm or whatever, and then guiding our uh, electrode recordings based on this, these patterns. People haven't done that. They haven't, you know, said, oh, let's look at the patterns in the human data and let's sample those brain data in the rodent models, because you might find some other interactions that you're just not sampling, um, right? And then in there, we can identify, do the optogenetics or look at the, um, you know, EEG oscillations or whatever uh, and, and do some refined manipulations to understand of the regions in this network, which are more important than others. And that might then guide a TMS application where you can choose which spot in these networks you want to engage to either ramp up or ramp down that emotion. That, that's just an idea. You don't have to go through the whole rat thing, you know, necessarily. Like, you could do some TMS. You know, there are some plausible TMS sites here. Um, so you could kind of go directly there. But if you really want to understand at the microcircuit level and the anatomy and stuff, then going back through the rodent models is, is useful. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>